Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming for, uh, for coming to this afternoon's session of Suburban Tales, From Ordinary to Extraordinary. It's lovely to see you all, and uh, thank you all for showing interest in the Ideas Festival this year and for coming and participating. Uh, our host for this afternoon is uh, Diane McKean. She will be facilitating this afternoon's event. Uh, we have Lisa Cox, who runs the Muse in the Mirror site, amongst other projects, and also Margaret Rankin, who, amongst many other projects, has done extensive work with the RSPCA. Once again, thanks for coming, everybody. We'll be having a Q&A session at the end of the interviews today, and I'll hand you over to Di. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Suburban Tales. I'm glad you could join us. Politicians certainly know how quickly fortunes can change. One minute you're Prime Minister having lunch at the Lodge, and the next you're looking for a job. And for some people, living quietly in the suburbs, life can also take an abrupt turn forcing them to reassess who they are and how they fit into society's puzzle. Today we meet two tenacious people who understand the value of resilience and determination. I'd like to introduce Lisa Cox, um, author, mentor and advocate of Healthy Body Image, and Margaret Rankin, who is a volunteer with the RSPCA who fights for forgotten animals in our community. Could you please make some welcome for them? <laughs> you first the fortunes of animals can change pretty quickly as well can't they one minute they're a favored pet at christmas time and next they're at the rspca can you tell us a little bit about why you joined the rspca as a volunteer well i started volunteering i think i saw a bit of an advertisement somewhere they're looking for foster carers and so i went along and did their program and um, started fostering some animals and I've gradually got more involved in the happenings over there. I now volunteer a couple of mornings a week. When you see the plight of the animals that come in at times, um, it's, some of them are just horrendous. Like at Christmas time, people surrender their animals because they're going on holidays. And maybe two weeks later, they'll come back and reclaim that animal. Uh, we, we know this goes on, but we don't have figures to um, uh, show it. Also, um, an animal gets sick and they find that they um, can't afford to um, uh, see a vet. I had um, the pleasure of looking after this little puppy that had um, been handed in because um, I think someone, it was a little Pomeranian, miniature Pomeranian, and I think they must have fed it the wrong thing because it had dreadful um, diarrhoea and stuff when it came in and was nearly on death's door. And um, so I took it home to recuperate and she, it was a gorgeous little puppy and she bounced back very quickly and uh, eventually found her own foster home. What sort of people make good volunteers in terms of animal welfare? I think people that um, have a rounded sort of life, they're well balanced, um, they have an affinity with animals. Uh, some people can let these animals go and then there are others that can't bear to part with an animal once they receive it into their house. So. I think it takes all type. I think the people like me that volunteer there and foster, we like to um, do the best we can for the animal while it's in our care and then we're able to hand it back and, and we do meet their new parents and we're just so happy that they fit into a nice uh, backyard home somewhere with lots of kids to play with and getting on about their doggy business. Now you talk about being foster parents. Now I've only heard that in relation to children. Can you explain how one becomes a foster parent and in what circumstances? Oh, well, they do advertise for foster carers and I think there's something like um, 2,000 in Queensland foster carers. Um, at any one given time, there's probably uh, three or 400 uh, animals out in foster care in the community. You can just uh, remember the floods that happened not so long ago and there were 300 animals uh, in the... Um, in the yards and people, there was a call went over the wireless and people turned up with their uh, trucks and their horse carriages and everything else that they could uh, take an animal home with and all those animals were fostered and they only had two hours to do this, okay. to evacuate the shelter and to find uh, foster carers for those uh, homes. Now 143 of those animals still remain with those people that took them because they turned around and adopted them. Right. And animals also come to you out of 
rather tragic circumstances as well and when court cases are ongoing. Can you tell us a bit yes, about Yes, we that? have what we call puppy farmers out there and I would suggest to anybody not to buy their animal over the internet. Um, they have these um, little um, breeding places. I mean, they can have up to a, an, a, a hundred animals on their premises. One particular case that she used to let all the males run around in this big paddock and then when a female come on heat, she just uh, let the female loose in there. And uh, within a, a couple of days, she took the female out and the, uh, the boys were still left running around. They were poodles. And of uh, course, they had no groom grooming and they also had no human contact. Um, and the condition that the mother had those puppies in were also horrendous. And those animals weren't groomed either. And she was running a very big business in... Um, uh, selling these poodles and so it's important that you see the breeders and the parents of an animal that you want to take home with you. And you looked after one of these poodles. Yes one of the poodles I mean was just so badly matted it had maggots in its um, coat, um, had discharge from the eyes, uh, very thin, uh, malnourished um, and it took six months for that animal with lots of tender care um, to settle down and uh, to become able to be patted and to, to be loved and to be a valued member. And there's also a group of people out there called animal hoarders. Explain that to me. Oh, well, these people really have a problem. Um, they hoard animals because they can't say no. Someone said, oh, there's this cat wandering around or there's this dog wandering around. So the person goes and um, takes the animal home and... and um, before long, they're out of control. The house isn't being cleaned anymore. All these animals are there, kept in cramped conditions. Uh, one person just can't clean up after, you know, 40 or 50 cats or dogs or whatever you, you've got there. Um, and they are also in uh, living in atrocious conditions. And it must be fairly distressing. Are you one of those people who goes into those circumstances to rescue No, I haven't animals? actually been out onto one of those. Um, mm -hmm. But it is very heart rendering. They have mainly their own staff um, go, and also the um, the vet services attend those cases. Not many volunteers go because a number of, or maybe a lot of those animals have to end up being euthanized. Right. Okay. And I guess some of the owners would be rather unhappy with that uh, with appearing as well. Oh yes, they would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever these cases come on, um, the RSPCA get a lot of hate mail and mm -hmm. hate phone calls and. Uh, all that sort of thing goes on as well. Can we talk about the um, surrender areas within the RSPCA? Now, you mentioned that um, people would buy the puppy and then they'd realise, ah, at some stage I've got to go on holidays, it's too expensive to put them in a kennel. So they, they drop them there, but then they pick them up. Yes, there are occasions when they come back out two or three weeks later, um, hoping that the animal's there and, and buy it back. But the animals that come into the centre under those circumstances, they're, they're in a holding stage and they're usually held for about two or three weeks just to have their um, veterinary check and just to make sure they have behavioural checks as well, uh, just to make sure that they can um, go, you know, to be re-adopted re, uh, again. Um, but as we know, some people come back and reclaim those animals. And people so, so do. Are you using this as cheap babysitting? Oh, it's probably yes, yeah, cheap. Um, it costs about twenty dollars a day, I think, to keep an animal in in um, kennels, in boarding kennels, mm -hmm. and so it ends up they, they have to pay a surrender price um, for the animals. But um, it, it is a lot better than having to fork out kennel fees. Right, and is that a widespread problem, or is it just? Well, it's very um, hard to to say whether it is or not. But we do see that same tendency at Christmas time and and mm -hmm. Easter time. Um, that happens so as well. Is the, is the message not getting through? Because the RSPCA has run many campaigns saying, you know, the dog is not, you know, animals are not just for Christmas, they're for life. You might ask how expendable animals are and then, you know, how expendable are we? Um, people seem to have that idea that easy come, easy go. Mm. They might have bought a puppy that was a giveaway or, right. you know, 40 or $50 <laughs> in a backyard sale and, well... And do people underestimate the cost of caring for an animal? Because I know vets oh, they don't take it are extraordinary. They don't take it into consideration, I'm sure. Right, right. Um, can you tell me about some of the animals that personally impacted upon you, the animals that you've met through the RSPCA? Uh, I, met, I met one little 
puppy not so long ago and I'm sure she was a warthog in disguise because <laughs> she just loved the water and she loved um, rolling in the mud. I had three of them. Uh, two of them were like this, but the little, this little female, I called her Tess, she was just really <laughs> a handful as far as getting into the water and I called her warthog, the little warthog. Um, and um, someone came around to, to have a look at her and I tried to... Um, you know, say, well, you know, she's a little warthog, you sure you want her? But she took her anyway, <laughs> just fell in love with her. And then I had another little chihuahua come in. She was a, a cruelty case. She was very old, obviously had been bred to death. She had a limp and she had some teeth missing and she arrived at my place. I had a... She was old as well. And I heated up a kennel for her. I've got all the modern cons at home for these animals. And she laid in that uh, little kennel for two or three weeks. And she had some good food to eat. Um, we gave her some pain relief for her arthritis. And she really came on and she was you know, getting around the yard quite well. I have other animals there as well. You know, I brought home two male poodles and um, out of this poodle episode. And um, anyway, I noticed that um, this little chihuahua was entertaining the boys up in the back shed. She'd entice them up the backyard and she turned out to be a little hussy. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, anyway, when she was due to, to go, I said to the vet, I said, you know, are you going to desex her? And she said, yes, I'll desex her. She, she'll find a home, don't you worry about it. And I was really doubting it because she wasn't the most beautiful thing to lay eyes, eyes on. And some lady come along and just fell in love with her immediately and, and took her home and fostered. But she was just a little... That's how tenacious sometimes these animals are under the right care and... Um, surroundings that they can thrive and, and be themselves. What makes you fall in love with an animal? What is it about an animal that, that um, really touches you? Well, it's unconditional. Um, you know, they, they don't stab you in the dark and, you know, they don't say nasty things about you and, um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and they always give you a nice warm, wet greeting when you come home and first thing in the morning. Um, and they can and be relentlessly bo loyal, can't they? Especially oh. even when they're treated badly. Well, that's right. I mean, I have a little poodle at home and she came from difficult circumstances. Not a poodle, another chihuahua. And, um, yeah, she just won't let anyone go to her. I'm, I'm, her, um, I'm her rock. and um, But she will let my husband pat her and everything now. But they all have their own little, little things. I won't have animals myself. I lost mine last year, and, but I'm just going to continue fostering because I'll all have puppies at home and... Mm. Does the RSPCA see any unusual animals? Like there must, you know, sometimes there's crazes with pot-bellied pigs and strange I critters like that. Do you see we had an emu in there a few <laughs> months ago. Um, oh, they have wildlife in there. Um, but they're not owned by anyone, are they? They just, they just. Well, some of them uh, have been seized. Oh. Um, some of the snakes. Yeah. Um, and but we get a lot of birds in these days. Um, you know, in the breeding season for the birds and the chicks have fallen out of the nest and people bring them in. Um, I'm just trying to think of... Um, I'm sure I'll think of something in the end that's pretty <laughs> unusual because this computer up here is working flat out at the moment. Um, yeah. No, I just can't really think of anything at the moment. I just take it all in my stride, really. Yeah. And yeah, You know, you're never surprised at what's going to come through the door. No. And that's so a challenge of it. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the RSPCA and the jobs that volunteers such as yourself can do because there's a wide variety and I don't think people realise. Well, there is a wide variety. I mean, most people think that they'll go and work for the animals, cleaning out pens um, and that sort of thing, walking animals. But there's a whole gambit of other things, you know, like every other charity, we get rubbish dumped there. So we need. I'm the queen of the, the chuck out there, <laughs> uh, queen of the dumpster, I call myself, and can throw a lot of things away. Um, they also have uh, animal rescues, the inspectors in, in the... Um, they have their boats that they go out. Um, uh, they were up in the Brisbane River during the floods, floating cows out of cir certain circumstances and um, rescuing them. Um, you can also land out in Moreton Bay somewhere trying to rescue a pelican or something like that. Um, the other work is we've got a forklift there. You can drive that around. We have an ambulance that goes around... Um, See, picking up injured animals um, uh, off the road or in somebody's yard or something. Um, we have all sorts of vehicles. Um, I might 
be asked to go down, take a utility down and pick up a big load of feed from one of the uh, um, big uh, supermarket warehouses because uh, they do, when they break their packaging, packaging and everything, um, they have to discard it. So we have bins down there and it gets thrown uh, into the bins and we just have to go and pick them up. You could be asked to go out to the airport and pick up some crates. You can be asked to, you know, um, drive around. You have a big um, trailer behind you. You take up to about 10 or 12 animals. You might be dropping them around. Vets around Brisbane uh, volunteer their time to the RSPCA and they help um, dissect some of the animals and also a lot of dental work's done as well. So, you know, if you just don't <coughs> think you can bear to be with the animals, there are a gambit of other positions around there, there's gardening and landscaping, you just name a job that you would like to do, you'll find it over there. And tell me about the relationship that you form with your other volunteers because obviously it's a, be a wonderful sense of community with like-minded people. Tell me a bit well, about Well, you that. tend to um, just meet the same, if you're going in there certain days of the week, you meet the same people all the time. And uh, I have a lot of younger people because I'm not so young now. Um, and the young girls and that, and I think they do tend to look up to me because they're always coming asking my advice and um, I'm giving them, telling them what to do and um, anyway, they just call me uh, Margie and uh, my husband also comes with me. So we are two sites to be seen around the RSPCA doing some of the jobs <laughs> that a lot of other people wouldn't do. So tell us some of the things that people should consider before buying an animal. Well, the first thing is, can you afford it? That's a big question. Your animal has to... People say the animals from the RSPCA are expensive, but they come with desects, they've been wormed, they've been fed, they sell um, so much supply of food to you, they're fully vaccinated, they're microchipped, and in some instances there's a um, doggy training uh, package sold with the animal as well because they might be some animal that we feel that may need this extra requirement for people to take it up um, so then you make sure you can afford the, um, the the vets that you're going to be requiring over the years um, you've got to feed them uh, every day or twice a day as the case may be so make sure you can afford to buy the proper food and not the cheap tins of food the tins of food I call them give the animals elephant turds so they're best on a, a good nutritional diet that can be readily bought in the supermarkets today, just not all that cheap stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, having a nice, good fenced yard uh, so that your animals can't get out and, and not stray. And the choice of animal is very important. You know, take into your lifestyle what sort of animal do you want. Do you have young children in your household? Because the, the uh, RSPCA behaviours tests all the animals that go on foster as best they can, um, so that if any child, their philosophy, if any child puts their hands through the fence and that dog's there, it's not going to get bitten. So, you know, people may think they euthanise animals unnecessarily sometimes, and this is the reason why if there's that potential there for that dog to be aggressive, it's not worth the risk. Mm. Tell us a little bit about pet shops and your feelings about pet shops. Oh, pet shops, uh, pet shops have changed uh, over the years, but I've, um, I, you know, I have seen, I know, just locally that um, the uh, pet shop used to have a sign up. You know, do you want to take the animals home overnight? But you know, if you need to see a vet, you pay for it. I mean, I don't think that went over very well. I think some pet shops are very reliable and a good source. Um, there are a lot of pet shops these days that don't sell uh, animals. Um, and others do, but I would say if you're buying an animal from a pet shop that, you know, you can't check the puppy's background, you can't see the parents of the dog um, and how it's been kept. Um, so my advice would be is not to buy an animal from a pet shop, um, but to go to a well-known breeder and you can do that through the uh, Canine Council and find out what type you're looking for and uh, where that dog is, can likely be sourced. But choosing the pet for your family life is the other critical answer. If you have a kelpie or a working dog, they need a lot of activity um, and to be uh, exercised every day. If you've got little children, like little pugs are ideal. 
uh, for little children and the little um, King Charles Spaniels. They're very nice natured little puppies. Um, and finally, what about fundraising um, and this whole sense of charity burnout? Um, are you finding it tough, especially after the floods, to have donations? Well, unfortunately, the RSPCA has been very blessed <coughs> um, this year. I mean, we are they are moving to the new uh, premises in um, uh, the end of September. It's going to happen because the Fairfield shelter is just absolutely horrendous to work in. It's you know. Health and safety-wise, it's not very good at all. But um, it is a community problem, these animals, and I think every person uh, should make a community contribution to caring or donating <coughs> or doing something for the care of these animals because it is our community problem to, to look after them. Animals are pretty resilient, though, aren't they? Oh, they are. Yeah. They are. And they bounce back and love you to death. <laughs> <coughs> now, my next guest knows all about resilience. Uh, Lisa Cox, as I mentioned before, is an author, mentor and advocate for a healthy body image. Now, Lisa, you've been dealt some pretty tough cards. Can you tell us your story, please? Right. My story, I'd like to say my story in a nutshell, but it's a pretty big nutshell. <laughs> so, uh, back to 2005, uh, about three, three months, six years ago to the date, pretty much, I was at the airport one morning flying home to my family and without any warning and through no fault of my own, I had a brain hemorrhage. Died twice in hospital, complete organ failure, two heart attacks, collapsed lungs. I was in a coma for three weeks, life support for two months. <coughs> Excuse me. And since then, I've had over a dozen operations, including heart surgery, a total hip replacement, and the amputation of all my toes, one leg, and nine fingertips. So I'm not jazzing things up or showing something more dramatic, but that's pretty much what happened. And I'm certainly not here today for anyone's pity or sympathy. So just so I've got that out of the way early on. It's pretty tough. Obviously, you're still emotional. It's very that tough. happened a um, number of years ago now, but it's six still, years it's, ago. It's still pretty raw for you. It is. It's it's always raw, and I. I speak about it now around around school, sharing my story, and um, it is it is still a little bit raw, but mm. I've certainly learned a lot from it. And you, a writer, before mm -hmm. this happened to you, and worked in the advertising industry. Can you tell me a little bit about how you perceived yourself before the um, illness? Well, prior to the illness, I had a, a background in sport, I suppose. So I perceived myself, I suppose, as a as a bit of an athlete or a uni and mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So that was that was pretty much how I perceived myself. Uh, there was it was very different how I perceived myself mm. today, I suppose. I never thought I would end up in a wheelchair as I am. And has it been a struggle to redefine yourself and view yourself? Uh, yes, obviously, but I think that the wider community, other people have had more trouble redefining me than I have had redefining me. Um, I find that people speak to me very slowly and loud. <laughs> Just because I'm in a wheelchair, I lost my leg, not my brain, so <laughs> we can have a normal conversation. Was that a shock to you? <laughs> it was a really, really big shock, actually, and it's, I don't know whether to laugh or yeah. throw up, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, now, what you're talking to us today is about women mm -hmm. and men are having a positive um, body image. Now, one of um, the videos on your website, which is called Muse in the Mirror, or one of your websites is called Muse in the Mirror, you have uh, a video of an American researcher and she's talking about how she had determined that up to 90% of American women had a negative view of their body. Uh, what do you think it is in Australia? Is it similar? Well, unfortunately, those statistics generally are the same in Australia. Sometimes it's closer to 80%, sometimes it's closer to 100%, depending on what magazine or research paper we read. But as a general rule, about 90%, the larger majority of women are unhappy with their bodies. So when I speak to young girls, young women at school, uh, there might be several hundred women in the room and I ask them to look around in front, behind, beside them. About 90% of all the women in this room even are unhappy with the way they look in some way, shape or form. 
and I've just explained in greater detail all of the terrible things that have happened to my body and shown them photos, which certainly weren't airbrushed and I'm covered in scars, most of which you can't see. And 90% of the audience in front of me are still unhappy with the way they look in some way, shape or form, and that really upsets me. What about young girls? Because you've been speaking to girls as young as four. Mm -hmm. what, what's their sense of self? Young How girls, unfortunately, we're seeing the um, body image dissatisfaction um, appearing at a younger and younger age. I spoke to a group of four-year-olds a little while ago and we, we changed the questions up a bit for four-year-olds to speak. So instead of saying, how do we, as a society, how does the media define beauty? We said, what do friendly people look like? Friendly people wear makeup and they have lipstick and they have nice clothes <laughs> and a few other things that four-year-olds say. But even at that really young age, we're seeing those, those sorts of trends come through. And I've done a lot of work with women's groups, collective shout about the sexualisation of, of young women and young girls, beauty pageants, you might have seen in the news in the last week or so, eight-year-olds being injected with Botox, and we won't go down that tangent because that's entirely different again, and don't get me started. Yeah. But um, <laughs> we are seeing these, these sorts of things that may have previously been in an older demographic creeping down into the younger, younger girls. So what sort of things are women worried about? I know I can tell you what I'm worried about, but what in general, what uh, are as a about? a sweeping statement, yeah. I'm gonna make all sorts of generalizations <laughs> yes, here, but I suppose uh, I'm early thirties and I'm assuming when I'm older I'll be more concerned about things like wrinkles than I am now. And the younger girls, even the the really little girls, maybe even the size the size and shape of their body, and that's why I do ask them to look at things, look at beauty as something that is not a delivered commodity, it can be bought or sold. David Jones doesn't sell it. Uh, Calvin Klein doesn't make it. It's not on the front cover of Vogue or Free Sample or Renaissance Marie Claire. But beauty is something that's not a physical commodity. So things like courage and confidence, self-respect are beautiful. And I ask the girls to look at it, look at it that way instead. Mm. Also, another video that you have on your website is quite dramatic and it talks about, well it, it shows you the process of photoshopping a model mm -hmm. to a very ordinary looking person and what they look like at the end of the campaign. So can you tell us a little bit about that because you know most of us are aware of the evils of photoshopping but I, I even I, that found, I found mm. shocking what they did to that model. So can you tell us a bit about sure, that? Sure, well that um, unfortunately is what I, I saw day to day in advertising but most of my former clients were financial services and tin fish, so <laughs> we were doing the same things to products of tuna, <laughs> but I know down the road it was, we were certainly, or they were certainly doing the same thing to, to men and women as well. Mm. But the video you're referring to is a, a young woman who is shown without any makeup, anything like that, and then within 30 seconds she's transformed with hair and makeup and lighting and all the other glamorous things that are done behind the scenes until we see the finished product in the magazines. And unfortunately, young women especially who maybe don't have those media literacy skills are only seeing the finished product at the end. They don't know the hours and hours that have gone in beforehand. And so that's essentially what I'm trying to do at the moment is with about a decade's worth of experience in the industry, take the girls behind the scenes and say, well, this is actually what we're doing that's what is happening and these are the before and after shots. One thing that I do in presentations is to show the girls a photo of me that's been airbrushed. And I say, what do you notice? That that's different. My hair, my the colour of my skin, I've got a tan, my tears are a bit whiter. I say, look a bit closer, what else do you notice? I've got fingertips. Well I don't, but I do in the picture. I had somebody photograph our uh, Photoshop fingertips on for me. And it could have just as easily been a new leg, new toes, five arms. And I say to the girls, it was that easy for them to Photoshop. To give me fingertips. Imagine how easy it is to Photoshop a little pimple or a freckle or a few extra inches off or on a bust or a waist or something like that. Mm. That's a bit of an eye-opener for them, I think. Mm, it, I mean, in that video, they were elongating necks, they were increasing the size of the eyes, moving the eyes, increasing the lips. It was extraordinary. That's right. Yeah. Um, and often women are told that men are very 
visual creatures. Um, and I bet those girls ask you those kinds of questions. Well, if we don't fuss about what we look like, boys won't like it. Is uh, that true? Sure, they do. I get asked all sorts of doozy questions, yeah. but um, it's, it's funny because when I speak to the guys by themselves and ask them for the sorts of attributes they're looking for, they don't talk about all these things, but when you talk to the girls and ask them what they think, it's completely different. So somewhere along the lines, they're getting their wires crossed and taking social cues from things like the media. So what are the boys telling you? The boys, well, there'll, there'll be a few who will joke <laughs> about, make football jokes and all those sorts of things. Yeah. But as a general rule, the, the self-respect and the honesty, all those, all those sorts of core values are more important to them than everything else which the media or their mates or, or something like that is, is telling them they, they should be looking for. So when you talk to these girls, do some of the things they say to you, does it shock you? Are there some specific things where you think, oh, I didn't even think of that? And it's part of the new generation of girls and how they perceive themselves? It, I am frequently shocked by how often the girls will come up to me after presentations and when the question time's over, one or two will either email me or speak to me at the end and go, oh, my mum's put me on a diet, my mum mm. makes me dye my hair or my parents mm. making me this, that or the other. And that's... That's really quite that shocking. quite upsetting, yeah. yeah. And do they want to? No, that's that's what no. they're saying. I, I don't want to. Mum's making me dye my hair, but I don't want to. And, so. and what are the parents afraid of? What the, I have <laughs> no idea. I'm not going to speak <laughs> to the parents. <laughs> um, so how do we go about fighting this sort of digitally altered world? And what, okay. what, what's your that's battle a plan? Massive, massive question. Oh, there's, <laughs> there's no uh, single... No. Uh, one thing that we can do. So yeah. I suppose personally I'm doing what I can given my field of experience and everything and that's why I I wrote the book for the young women. So um, tell us about the book and the name of it's the book. Okay, does my bum look big in this ad? I wrote the book because speaking to all the young women, I was frequently being asked questions about media literacy, body image, all those sorts of things. I thought it would be great as a resource for young women to say, well, I haven't got all the answers today. You have to get X class, but here, read this. Um, and all the research I did, I couldn't find anything for young girls. And having spent many years at university, I know there's heaps of literature out there and websites, articles, everything written for the professionals, the academics, about media literacy, body image dissatisfaction, all these sorts of things. But there was nothing for the children themselves. And I kept attending workshop after workshop where the key message we took from it was that early intervention is really key. So getting to young people how important it is to have a healthy body image. But there was nothing actually written for the young people. So I'm always telling the kids to be the change you want to see in the world. And I'll quote from Gandhi, be the mm. change you want to see in the world. Don't just bitch about it on Facebook. Be the change. <laughs> so I thought, well... I may as well do that. And so I, I wrote a book. I'm pretty slow at typing these days. I'm 25% blind as well as being a brain hemorrhage, so I'm a very fast typer. But put a little book together, does my bubble look big in this ad? And we've just been asked to write a, write a boy version as well because we're seeing these trends with poor body image creep through with the young men as well. We'll, we'll talk about that as well. The men are also hitting the spotlight in terms of fashion and beauty. So how is this whole manscaping thing affecting them? The whole manscaping thing? Well, I... A poor Aussie bloke, so not to be a shock to them. You know, it might be all right for the, you know, the Europeans, but... Yes, well, speaking as a male, <laughs> I know a lot about this. Um, I've actually spoken to a few guys to get their opinions, given that I'm no expert on, on what the guys are thinking, <laughs> and they're seeing a lot more of the... Um, trainers at my gym, for example, a lot more steroid abuse, those sorts of things creeping through from my point of view, um, an advertising background. We're seeing L'Oreal, Nivea, all those women's beauty brands now going out a men's line as well. So we're seeing a lot more of, um, of those sorts of things creep through in, in the advertising world. Mm -hmm. Feminisation of men. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, and... In previous generations, I suppose you thought the older we get, we can start wearing more comfortable shoes, we can segue into the wise woman thing. Um, but then along came Botox. Mm -hmm. And now I've still got to look like a 
15 year old. What do you, what That's do you think right. Well, that? they actually talked about using Botox on me. In my foot, my one remaining foot to get rid of some spasms, but that's another yeah. story entirely. Yeah. Yes, yes. And what, and what, do you, what do you think about that? I was listening to a debate on ABC Radio and they were talking about facelifts and Botox and fillers and things like that. And, and it was a talkback show and not a single person called in and said, ah, oh, this is outrageous. Why would people, why would women want to do, or men want to do that to themselves? Everyone seemed to be on the same page that that's what it is now. Does that shock you? Or? It, it does shock me a little bit, but it's almost, oh, a bit of Botox. Yeah. Yeah. No biggie, fine. Mm, they assume that if they don't, they assume it will affect their career prospects or mm. if they're, um, you know, looking at a second marriage, they won't be able to attract a mate. It seems, it's sort of, so it's not just the young girls that are affected by what that's the media right. is t telling us. Um, what about yourself? Are you uncomfortable with people saying, focusing on your looks, telling you you're beautiful? Of course you are. Why, thank you. Uh, yes and no, people focusing on my looks, so long as they don't speak slowly <laughs> to me. No, I, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. It's just, just part and parcel with, with having four wheels that people are often going to see the chair before they see you. Mm. And I've had interesting conversations with people where I'll be, I can stand and I'll maybe be standing up and or sitting down and I'll have absolutely no idea of my, my prior story. And I'll be chatting away and I remember once I was at a bar and talking away to a friend and said, oh, whose wheelchair is that over there? And I went, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> and he made a very quick excuse to run in the other direction. <laughs> Wheelchairs aren't contagious, amputations yeah. are not contagious, <laughs> but people seem to assume they are and want to take a step back. <laughs> um, one of the things that we have spoken about also is this, um, and it, it seems to be a growing movement, which is lovely, this sense of, of gratitude, which mm -hmm. you are trying to focus on more as well. That's Tell right. us a little bit about that. I talk a lot about gratitude in the presentations I give to the young girls and I can just take a moment to, to speak about that. I, I talk about, I suppose, being grateful for what I do have rather and focusing on what I can do rather than focusing on what I can't do and what I don't have. I don't have a big house, an expensive car, a wardrobe full of designer clothes or expensive jewellery, but I do have an enormous amount of gratitude. Gratitude for the people and the experiences that have built and rebuilt Lisa Cox Mum, Dad, Tracy and David, I don't know where you are in the audience. My mother, father, brother and sister, I'm going to not tear up here. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> beautiful people. But um, I try to ask people not, not only to be grateful for the big things. I'm grateful for my big Mazda in the driveway. I'm grateful for my mansion at the coast. I'm also grateful for the tiniest, tiniest things, even if they mean absolutely nothing to anybody else. The fact that I'm here speaking with everyone today probably isn't that big a deal, but is a huge personal accomplishment for me. Six years, three months, and one day ago, my family were told they might have to turn off my life support. I could not move a muscle, seriously could not breathe for myself. I had machines breathing for me. And I certainly couldn't talk, which at the time probably was a good thing. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm so grateful just to be doing little things like speaking and grateful that I could get home, get all those sorts of things that a lot of other people didn't have the chance to do. Tell me about your, your tell your audience about your Tupperware. My Tupperware? <laughs> we were talking about my Tupperware earlier. Okay. Uh, I was in hospital the first time, I was in there a few times, but the first time for over a year. And uh, between a few hospitals. And finally they let me go home permanently, which wasn't that permanent. I ended up going back. but permanently and I was packing up my belongings, not that there were many, I had one singlet and a Tupperware container full of a few personal belongings, a clothes peg to remind me of home, a pen because I was a writer to remind me that I always wanted to write and reading glasses and maybe some tomato sauce to make hospital food taste better. <laughs> but um, my entire life for a year had been contained in one That's Tupperware right. container. That was it. All my happiness all of my joy, everything, my accomplishments, achievements were not a car or a house or clothes or anything like that. It was all in that Tupperware container. All of my happiness had come from 
see my family in my in my hospital room, those sorts of little things. And fair enough, I didn't have kids or a job, but that's beside the point. It was all in the Tupperware container, and that that's what we <laughs> meant by the Tupperware container. That was my life for a year, mm -hmm. and now every time I go to move into a, a new place, I think, well, you know, I can probably live without, if I live for a, a year without all of those other things, and we're still happy, I can do it again. Yeah. Margaret, do you sit down sometimes and think, gee, I'm just jolly grateful for a whole lot of things? Oh, you know, I'm happy that I wake up every morning. Yeah, that's a blessing. I'm happy that I'm living in my own home and independent. Yeah. Do you think some of the messages um, that you're giving <coughs> young people um, are sinking in? And what are some of the key points you would tell a young teenage girl who is struggling with her, with the view, sh the view that she has of herself? I certainly hope they're, they're sinking in and all I have to go by are the, the little emails of thanks or the, I remember after a presentation, one girl came up to me crying her eyes out and said, I nearly changed myself for a man, but now I'm not going to, thank you. And <laughs> <laughs> that really actually touched my heart. But uh, it's, it's those sorts of little things. Um, six years ago, I was saying, why me? Why on earth? You, whoever you are, why have you done this? But when those little girls come up to you and say thank you or send you an email and sort of answers the question of, of the why, but the one thing that I, I constantly try to remind them is that beauty is not a physical commodity. Let's not look at it as, as something that only Barbie has or IQ that we need to take from social media or any media. You never had a Barbie, did you? I never had a Barbie. <laughs> Mum never bought me a Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, we'll talk to her about that. No, after. thank you, Mum. <laughs> um, so what should young girls do and what should women do or men do with men's health, et cetera? Should we just throw those magazines away or what, what's the solution? Or is everything like diet, everything in moderation? Or Everything in moderation, I suppose. But what I, I do try to tell, not just the young girls, but everybody, but is being a socially responsible consumer, we're all aware of the green movement, how we can be an environmentally conscious consumer and by the dishwasher that's more energy efficient, the green, the green car, et cetera, et cetera, we can do this with our media as well. So it's one thing to sit there and complain, oh, I don't like balloons, they airbrush, it's just not mm. fair, and then go home and pick up a magazine on the way home from work or buy one on the weekend for our daughter or our friend. So as consumers, we need to be responsible for our own actions as well. Um, having spent 10 years in the industry, unfortunately, if we keep buying it, some book out there is going to keep printing it or making it or doing something like that. So as consumers, it's our responsibility to put up our hands and, and do our part. But At least not to justify the that's <laughs> going on out there. But things are changing little by little, aren't they? You little by little. The Dove ads and... and Certain countries are saying no, we're not going to have size two models, and so things are things are slowly changing, aren't they? Slowly but surely, but just as we think they're changing, there'll be a, another media article released about uh, ninety percent of women hating themselves and six-year-olds on diets and all sorts of things like that. Unfortunately, and what can we look forward to from you in the future in terms of Lisa Cox, the writer? <laughs> uh, we've got the Media Muscle, the boys' book coming out next year and someone laughs at me when I say I'm writing my memoir so please don't laugh <laughs> I'm writing no, that's <laughs> I've been asked so many times you need to put your story down so I'm, I'm putting my story together at the moment as I said before I'm a very slow typer these <laughs> days so I'm putting all of that together I'm on a huge learning curve because I have a, about a year's worth of amnesia from a brain hemorrhage so I'm, I'm reading my story thinking Wow, did that happen that I go, oh, that's me. Jeez. Oh, the poor thing. Jeez. Oh. So I'm, I'm still on the learning curve and, and finding out things as I go along as I, as I read mum's or dad's collection of events. I think now is a good time to ask our audience if they've got any questions for Lisa or for Margaret. Does anyone? Um, I think, do we have a, I think we have a microphone actually. Hi. Uh, it's not really so much a question, it's just an expression of gratitude. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question 
Lisa. I have a question for one each. Is that okay? Yeah, um, really. Can I ask you first? Uh, sorry, Lisa, Lisa yeah. was it? Um, well, thank you, like Jetta. I'm really grateful for what both of you have said. Um, it's been very inspiring. Now, when I go to the hairdresser, they offer me three magazines. They're all trashy. Yep. And so I bring my book. That's but I sort I of expect that. But where yeah. I find it really offensive is when I go to my GP. Because mm. I wonder, you know, what, what interest might my GP... You know, what assumptions mm. does my GP make about me? But also, what body image does somebody whose primary profession is to promote health in every respect, uh, both mentally and physically, uh, think they're doing when they're putting out those? So I don't know about your schedule for the next year, but could you go around the GPs, please, <laughs> and educate <laughs> them? It's funny you mention that because in, in hospital there's a lot of trashy magazines. Mm -hmm. And so I'm there with both arms up in plaster, one leg gone, another toe, both foot rotting, reading articles about mm -hmm. women who hate their bodies because their legs are fat and hairy mm -hmm. and need a spray tan, mm -hmm. just thinking, my gosh. Give me one of those. Yes, I'll have one of those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give me Sarah Leo any day to put my leg back. <laughs> Anyway, I would be grateful if you could do something in that space. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> a lovely lady from the RSPCA, I uh, admire the work that you do, I really do, and, and I think the RSPCA is a wonderful institution. Um, I, uh, I'm, however, I'm also a wildlife carer, uh, and amongst the wildlife carers, RSPCA has a rather bad reputation. Whether that's deserved or not, I really have no opinion on because I don't have any personal experience. But can you explain why that might be so? I didn't quite get the question. The question is, uh, amongst wildlife carers, so people who look after the um, uh, Australian native wildlife, you know, the kangaroos and the wallabies and the, you know, the kookaburras and that sort of thing, the RSPCA has a rather bad reputation for being uncooperative in that space. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I've, we've been members of various wildlife care organisations. We are carers ourselves. We don't have personal experience, but we keep hearing it. Can you explain why that might be so? Do you have a policy that says, you know, uh, introduce cats and dogs only, no wildlife? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, look, they have a very big um, wildlife section there. Um, perhaps um, they might do things... Um, they, they look at things a bit differently. I mean, they like to... You know, if it is wildlife, return the, the animal back from where they came from. We, we work with a lot of wildlife groups. I mean, I, um, we see, receive cages and all these sorts of equipment and stuff and we, you know, hand it out to a lot of the wildlife carers. Um, and the care, wildlife carers I've come across, which is, you know, only just a small number, um, they work very well with the RSPCA. So um, I haven't heard what you've said at all, but, you know, I'll certainly uh, make some more inquiries about that. But, you know, the wildlife, we don't have that much to do, although you can work in the wildlife section if you choose to. Mm. Um, the, the RSPCA has been going for many, many years. I suppose you've got a very specific way of doing things and you know, specific I mean, guidelines. Uh, well, that's right, and they get criticised for you know, the euth all the euthanasia of cats and kittens that, that they come across. I mean, there's very good reason for that a lot of the time, but, um, you know, there, there are criticisms there. You only need one person to criticise as well and it can spread very rapidly, but a person doing a nice job mm. doesn't seem to spread very far at all. So, um, on a completely unrelated note, you just talked about um, spreading the good word. Mm. Just very, very quickly, Queensland Health have done an absolutely fantastic job. They've had nothing but bad media, <laughs> bad media for the last few years. I would just like to take this moment, there's nobody here from Queensland Health, but <laughs> to just say, Queensland Health, you're fantastic. Um, I am. <laughs> when I came out of hospital... One of my badges. When I came out of hospital, I wrote a, a letter to the, the health minister to just say, Queensland Health have done a fantastic job. After a year in, in hospital, I'd seen nothing but bad media, and they were fantastic, but no-one wants to talk about the good news, so... Mm -hmm. I'll say instead. Anyway, that's my piece, sorry. Yeah, wonderful. I think it's the individuals you come across at mm. the time. I mean, you can get some very nice individuals in nursing and medicine and you can get some that aren't so nice. And to have a good experience, you've, you've struck the right people. Mm. I was a nurse for 35 years. So oh, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs>
Yes, hello. Um, directed to Lisa over here on this oh, side. There you are. Hello, I. Hi. <laughs> Very bright. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, just something I experienced at, in Victoria at one of our fine art institutions. It was very interesting to observe amongst the um, people selected to do painting, printmaking, that sort of work. We were a really mixed, motley lot. But the photography faculty had a bias without knowing it and were selecting uh, visually unchallenging and interesting um, objects, if you like. When we challenged them on that, they were really quite shocked. So we were slapping down the photographs. You know, look, 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 you know, and then he, here's us, mixed. Um, so I think sometimes people aren't aware of the bias that they're introducing. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and um, the other one is uh, I'm a 54-year-old woman who wears her whiskers uh, in terms of um, advocating for the biodiversity. Mm. Uh, and I think that's something that everyone can do actually in some way is just whatever's different about them, try and say, well, you know, I'm here and I don't need that and mm -hmm. you look terrific because it's really, you, you were alluding to this before, it's the smile, you know, anyone can <laughs> look like anything um, and you think, oh, she's a grumpy looking old thing even though she might, you know, be something they'd use as a model and then she flashes a smile and you think, I like her or she looks good. Same for us in the art fa faculty who... You know, we had eyes going in one direction and teeth in another and we were limping and <laughs> stuff like that. So, you know, people just don't realise uh, what they're doing in their selection of what they're um, incorporating and also what they're squashing yeah, in not going right. for that diversity. We, we see that reflected in, in who 100 most beautiful people, the 100 most beautiful mm. people are all genetically flawless and genetically mm. blessed and airbrushed beyond belief. So what, what can we expect when that's the example we're set and we're seeing that, that trickle down into your art faculty, for example? Um, I'll, I'll add something to that. We've um, come to Australia, Ulrika and I have come to Australia some 10 years ago or so, and um, for some reason we got fanatically interested in Australian wildlife and spent every weekend um, in workshops and so forth. And... Um, we found it interesting that some Australian wildlife, um, when, you, when you try to identify it, when, when you try to spot it in the woods somewhere in the rainforest or something, you have a guidebook, there's a photo in there, and then some clever person who's in the group with you points out something on the ground and says, oh, that's a so-and-so, and you go through your guidebook and you find a photo and you say, that doesn't look anything like it. <laughs> and Rick Natras was clever enough to point out to us at the time that the photo that you find in the guidebook is a single individual. The single individual couldn't possibly represent the entire spectrum of, of individual properties and individual um, uh, looks that, that uh, this species as such can produce. And I think with a lot of the media, um, magazines and TV shows and so forth, we kind of suffer a little from that phenomenon that somehow a stylized, idealized version of human being is, is being presented. And I'm not surprised that kids are confused, that they don't look like the people in the magazines do. But that's the same thing as if a snake that you see on the ground doesn't resemble the one in the guidebook. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting analogy you make, because you're exactly right. Oh, well. I've just oh, thought of the most unusual... Oh was a little wattle bat. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has seen a little wattle bat. No. They're tiny, about that small. And we had to find a carer for it. And it's usually the people that look after the flying foxes. And this is where we work well with a lot of the wildlife groups. And anyway, that lady that took... I used to go and visit because we found the bat, actually, my husband and I. Um, and we went to visit the bat from time to time and she said it would fly around the house at night and land itself on a pillow. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it really made itself at home there. But they eventually released that little bat over at Coogee Mudlow because there was quite a big population of them over there. But this tiny, oh, tiny oh. little... We thought it was well, a baby. Well, it was a baby wattle, but they don't get much bigger. When are they black-coloured or what did they... Oh, uh, no, it was a very... Oh, really dark, yeah black brown colour. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gorgeous. 
See, and the way they keep them and everything, <laughs> you know, they have little cupboards they put them in, you know, and keep them safe. Beautiful. I think there's a gentleman over here. Um, I just have a question for Lisa. I realise there are a lot of beauty guides out there and I wonder maybe if you could amend one of the chapters and <laughs> put some uh, an etiquette guide for wheelchairs uh, uh, and, and have, have some fun with that. So I realise I'm a small minority of the, the general community, a, a beauty guide for wheelchairs. Interesting idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it to somebody. I'm not sure I'll take you seriously, but... But just ha just have some fun with, uh, with 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 how people relate to you and, and talk to you too. Oh you know. right, okay. Because I mean, we have an etiquette guide for everything else. You know how you're supposed to look at various, what I to wear for mean. various occasions. So maybe uh, that has want actually now I know what you're, you're mm. speaking about. Has been suggested to me before how to, uh, in in simple in simple terms, how to talk to people in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. No, definitely from how you talk to <laughs> anyone yes. else, basically. Yes. But it's a very short book, that one. Very short yeah. book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not a lot to it. And I, I was telling uh, Lisa when we first met today that um, years ago when I started reporting, I was talking to um, a disability activist in the early 90s in Cairns and she said, and this is when they were first putting um, disabled toilets in a lot of the public areas in Cairns, and she said, you, you go into one of these toilets and, 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 and have a look at what's inside there and, he said, and I'll tell you what's not inside there and it's a mirror. And I presume that... If you were disabled, you wouldn't want to make yourself presentable or look at yourself. It, I, it was extraordinary, and that, that was, you know, that's obviously in the 90s. But so we, we have yeah. come away, but still a I long way to go. Just speak about the, the disability thing. I do, I do speak about that a little bit, but uh, not an awful lot. People assume that while she's in a wheelchair, she must be here to talk about wheelchairs and disabilities, and then I start mm. talking about something else and mm. seem to take people by surprise. But I was at a, a disability conference a while ago, and for the sake of ticking a box on a government form, I have a disability. And I think, though, that, well, it's it's not really a wheelchair or a walking frame or prosthetic limbs or anything like that that make us disabled. It's attitudes and a selfish yeah, attitude, mm -hmm. a yeah, lazy attitude, uh, something like that is more disabling than a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. A lazy attitude will cripple you. Mm. And I think that maybe selfish people, for example, bullies. I told the kids that bullies are more disabled than me. Mm. Only they didn't get a free parking permit for the shopping centres. <laughs> That's a good bit about it. But um, in, with regard to disability, I guess that's about all I have to say about it, to be honest. <laughs> it's nice and succinct. Anyone else? Hi, it's Ariane here. I'm actually an old friend of Lisa's from high school. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for speaking. I just saw it in the program today. Um, I actually had a question for Lisa, and I thought I might ask in front of everyone instead of later. Been here for 15 years. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking about the things you're talking about to young girls at school, and we went through high school together. Mm. And my question for you is, and perhaps you're exploring this in your memoir, how um, how do you think? the media affected you or us as a group of young girls as high school growing up. Um, I think Lois and Clark was the show we used to watch yeah, most of the time. Yeah. And do you think that media literacy might have changed the way we felt about ourselves and the way we behaved if we'd had something I then? I think it may have a little bit. I got a, a little bit of media literacy from home. Mum and Dad never believe what you see on the papers, that sort of thing. But like, like a lot of teenage girls, I suppose, of course, I... I looked at, I had one dolly magazine until I was 20 or something, so never had a lot of magazines in my house, but always thought, she looks like that, where's mine gone? <laughs> <laughs> Wondered why maybe I wasn't looking like the other girls, as we all did, as, as a lot of teenagers do trying to fit in, and I'm thinking that media literacy to a certain extent would have helped if I'd known about Target shopping and those sorts of things then. It wasn't talked about when, when I was at high school, it probably would have helped. Anyone else? Okay, if there's no more questions, um, I would like to thank our two wonderful guests, Margaret from the RSPCA and Lisa Cox. <laughs> uh, I think um, I 
think they're all grateful for the work that they do. It's, it's, um, it's very uh, important and often undervalued. This is the second session in the Suburban Tales series. Uh, our final one is tomorrow. Um, so if uh, you'd like to listen to us as more inspirational speakers, please come along. We've got the Ecumenical Coffee Brigade and um, a liver specialist by the name of uh, Dr Kelly Slater who saved a child in a uh, shopping centre. So please join us then. Thank you. On behalf of the library, thanks you, uh, for coming and let's also give one final round of applause not only to our speakers but to Di, our wonderful host. <laughs> <laughs>